Well, first of all, apologies to Axel and to everybody for the disruption I caused. My phone started to behave erratically, and no numbers were ringing, and it was silence, but I don't know. I'm really sorry. Okay, so um, I will show you um, progress from our spoke, uh, the Vaisoka and Celeri Laboratory, on epigenetic landscapes and regulatory divergence of human craniofacial traits. So uh, I will start with the acknowledgements in the first slide. So I will cover it from the very beginning. So we have here Joanna, our leader at Stanford. Uh, she unfortunately cannot be here today uh, due to serious condition of her mother back in Poland. Uh, we have Tomek, who does all the bioinformatics uh, work at Stanford, and Hannah Long, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. We have then uh, Ian Welsh, uh, who is a postdoc at UCSF. Uh, myself at UCSF, we relocated to UCSF two years ago from uh, Cornell. And then we have uh, Carissa Hansen, who is a uh, uh, research assistant, and Bob Aho, who is the data analyst uh, in our laboratory. And of course, last but not least, we have the chimps and uh, humans. So uh, the aims uh, of our uh, proposal originally were, uh, which have been maintained, were aim one, to characterize the epigenetic landscapes and transcriptomes of human and chimpanzee uh, cranial neural crest cells, and to identify conserved and species-specific uh, cis-regulatory elements. And uh, more than 14,000 enhancers have been identified, of which 13% are species biased, either human biased or uh, chim biased. Uh, this work uh, is being conducted at Stanford. And aim two, uh, the responsibility of my laboratory, uh, is to analyze uh, functionally the activity of uh, candidate craniofacial enhancers in vivo by doing transgenesis in the mouse. And uh, we have fully analyzed the activity of uh, 52 enhancers, of which 20 pairs human chimpanzee and 12 human enhancers. So uh, we all know the system that uh, Joanna uh, and uh, her postdocs established in uh, the laboratory. It is difficult to access um, cranial neural crest uh, cell in humans. It is uh, rather inaccessible. So they uh, <coughs> established a uh, um, uh, technique, and uh, here we have uh, uh, by Pai here, who's uh, come to visit us, uh, by which uh, taking uh, human embryonic stem cells, or IPS, uh, they were able to make them differentiate into neuroepithelium and then subsequently into uh, emigrating uh, uh, cranial neural crest cells and then more mature differentiating cranial neural crest cells, which express uh, typical markers of, uh, um, of uh, cranial neural crest in vivo. So having these uh, large amounts of uh, cells in, in culture uh, was very advantageous for the epigenomic strategy that uh, the Weissocka lab undertook for systemic annotation of human cranial neural crest regulatory elements. And uh, these genome-wide studies, genomic studies, were conducted by ChIP-seq with chromatin, chromatin marks or transcription factors or coactivators, ATAC-seq for chromatin accessibility, and then RNA-seq. Uh, so that enhancer signatures could be uh, identified uh, based on the chromatin marks and the uh, chromatin accessibility and the presence of uh, transcription factors and co-activators, and also uh, then promoter signatures could be identified, and then downstream target genes uh, by intersecting all these ChIP-seq and DataSeq data with the RNA-seq data could be <coughs> identified. So practically, for what concerns the part on the human cranial neural crest cells, um, all these experiments, genomics experiments, were conducted, and all results were generated in three different human genetic backgrounds. Uh, so many data sets were produced in replicates to increase the robustness. And then, uh, by now, all the ChIP-seq uh, data sets are already available on uh, FaceBase website. And now, Tom X. Vigut is working with the hub to upload upload the RNA-seq data sets and to implement the browser visualization. 
So given the talk of uh, Axel, I don't need to spend time to say how uh, using uh, classical uh, transient transgenesis in the mouse, we uh, take uh, these uh, craniofacial enhancers identified based on uh, bioinformatics predictions from the genomic experiments, and we test their activity in, in vivo in the mouse by transient transgenesis. So the enhancer is cloned upstream of like Z uh, cassette, and then injected, the construct injected into the pronucleus, and then we stain the embryos usually at 11.5 of gestation uh, with beta-galactosidase and look at blue domains in the embryonic structures. Uh, we started by using the old construct from David Kinsley's lab, the HSP68 construct, and we have now modified it to uh, generate a more versatile <coughs> and more sensitive um, construct for transgenesis, where we have indeed uh, flanked the uh, enhancer by insulators uh, so as to minimize the variability due to uh, insertion effects. We have also cloned in uh, downstream of LAXZ a uh, DT tomato cassette that enables fluorescence uh, detection of these um, Mm, uh, domains of activity of the enhancers. And then we have put uh, by the poly A, uh, Wuchak hepatitis uh, <coughs> post transcriptional uh, uh, regulator uh, element that increases uh, enhancer activity and therefore uh, increases expression of the uh, enhancer itself. So uh, we have obviously a wealth of data sets and of uh, uh, landscapes that can be uh, studied. And how do we select on which to go in vertically and deeply and to try to understand more about uh, functional regulation, uh, also with an implication uh, to craniofacial development and craniofacial disease. I will give you now uh, a vignette here uh, showing uh, how we have selected, for example, the SOXA9 locus for this deeper analysis, starting from this uh, uh, huge wealth of data sets that have been generated. So the SOX9 locus has been shown um, in the literature to be associated with disease mutations in certain syndromes, one of which is a Pierre Robin sequence, by which elements, regulatory elements, uh, upstream of SOX9 uh, are uh, either deleted or mutated or translocated uh, <coughs> Uh, in uh, specific uh, diseases. Uh, SOX9, uh, the reason also was, uh, it was chosen was because it has very high expression in the, uh, the cellular system for cranial neural crest. As you can see, it is highly expressed in early migrating cranial neural crest in the cellular system and also at later gestational days. And uh, when in my lab, Ian Welsh looked at uh, by in situ hybridization at endogenous mRNA expression, he saw that indeed SOX9 is expressed in the branchial arch, in second branchial arch, in the uh, Meckel cartilage, it is expressed in the periocular mesenchyme, in the medial nasal process, and many other uh, craniofacial structures, plus the limb buds. So, um, Pierre Robin sequence, as I said, is, uh, has been involved uh, in uh, mutations or deletion of uh, elements upstream of SOX9. He, as we heard already uh, from Yang Chai, it is a cranial neurocrystopathy and uh, the uh, disease involved a smaller jaw. Micrognathia, as we heard from Young, the tongue falls back and is called glossoptosis, and we can have indeed also clefting of the palate as a result of that. And these are images of affected children. Uh, the expressivity of this uh, disease is quite uh, strikingly uh, uh, different. So the thought was, can we, uh, starting from the wealth of data sets we have generated, identify and dissect the function of tissue-specific enhancers that are required for the development of these craniofacial structures that are uh, so severely affected by Pierre Robin syndrome. So uh, Anna Long in the laboratory of Joanna um, started to do uh, chromatin conformation capture, high C, to comprehensively detect chromatin interactions in, uh, at the SOX9 locus and to demarcate uh, TEDs, topological associated domains. So in this situation, we are uh, privileged because we know that genes can interact with regulatory elements within the same TED. And in this case, we have one TED and one gene 
SOX 9 alone in this gene desert. And so uh, we decided to uh, focus on this TED here, which comprises SOX 9, and it comprises also the region which is deleted in Pierre Robin syndrome, as uh, discovered by previously uh, by the group of Lyonnais, and to focus on um, these enhancer elements contained within the TED, especially these three elements that you see as vertical lines, uh, an answer that we name 145, 135, and 125, we see here in green. So if we zoom in into this gene desert where SOX9 is contained within its own TED, we can see these are the regions deleted or translocated in Pierre Robin syndromes as identified by previous reports and studies. And we can see that overlapping with these deletions, there are indeed three regions, three elements, that contain signatures for chromatin marks as identified by the genomic studies uh, in Johanna's lab. And these three elements, very interestingly, are detected in uh, the in vitro system for cranial neural crest cell differentiation. But look at this, very intriguingly and interestingly, they are absent when the same chromatin marks are mapped on human embryonic stem cells. These experiments conducted by Hannah Long uh, at Stanford. So indeed, these enhancers are not active in human embryonic stem cells where SOX9 is not expressed and they are indeed appear to be cranial neural uh, crest cell specific. So we have uh, characterized the activity of these enhancers at uh, five prime of the SOX9 gene, and you can see here the three uh, elements. And uh, as you can see, for 145, uh, the results were incredibly uh, pleasing from the very beginning. Four uh, embryos out of four transgenic positive uh, 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 embryos were LAXZ like positive in reproducible, with the reproducible staining patterns in the uh, lateral nasal process, maxillary process, in the uh, periocular uh, mesenchyme, and also in the anterior limb bud. But so we were never able, uh, however, to detect any reproducible activity for this element, Enhancer 135. So what happens for Enhancer 125, the most uh, <coughs> uh, 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 adiation to the SOX9 locus? So Hannah uh, subcloned actually various uh, elements within this enhancer, and when we tested the uh, sub-element 5, which corresponds to a very high peak for the presence of these chromatin marks uh, that are decorated there, we saw that at 11.5, the element S5 was indeed uh, reprodu uh, it was reproduce uh, showing reproducible patterns in the dorsal root ganglia, in the trigeminal ganglia, uh, but it was not present in the domains that are uh, affected by the craniofacial malformation of Pierre Robin syndrome. But then what we decided to do was to go and look earlier. So when we looked at 9.5, as I hope you can appreciate, this enhancer that is silent in the branchial arches and in the domain affected by Pierre Robin syndrome, you go uh, 48 hours earlier and you see reproducible expression in branchial arch 1, in branchial arch 2, in the otic vesicle, and in the domains that indeed are affected by Pierre Robin syndrome. And so this indeed, I would like to get this notion here underscored, that we uh, identified very dynamic expression patterns for these enhancers at the SOX9 locus. And activity in branchial arches, for example, for the, nine point, uh, for the element 125, is present only at 9.5. I will add already that results that were obtained in the lab just the day before I left uh, for the Enhancer 1.45 show the opposite situation. Enhancer 1.45, as I showed you, at 11.5 shows activity in the branchial arches. When Carissa tested it at 9.5, the branchial arches are completely silent. So I would like to really get this point across that uh, usually we test enhancers at one gestational day and usually we use 11.5, the community has chosen that day, because that's when it is most informative for the formation of the craniofacial structures. But I would like it to be uh, really, uh, to, to give this message to take home, that some of these enhancers, and we believe not only at the SOX9 locus, show very highly dynamic expression patterns where activity can appear and disappear just in a few, within a few hours. 
So I should mention that just a few days ago, the paper came, uh, on cell reports was published by Justin Cotney Group. Uh, <clears throat> And from that paper, it was obvious that uh, they also focused on, uh, looked at the build genom genomics map with multiple chromatin marks. And uh, um, it, they also focused on the Pierre Robin uh, sequence at the SOX9 locus. And comparing the data uh, published by the Cotney lab, which did these analysis on human tissues, uh, uh, isolating them from human embryos, and uh, comparing their data sets for H3K27 as acetylation versus the data set of, the, uh, of Johanna's lab, it is clear that the overlaps are quite striking, which for us is very pleasing because obviously it compares studies conducted in vivo in human tissues versus the studies conducted in uh, the cranial neural crest differentiation system uh, from Johanna's lab. And as you can see, at these three regions that we have decided to mostly focus on with these elements contained in the SOX9 TAD and also deleted in the Pierre Robin syndrome, uh, we, we see very striking overlap of uh, chromatin signatures. So I will add that we have started, uh, my laboratory has started this past summer to do high resolution episcopic microscopy, HRM, of these enhancers elements. When I took a short sabbatical and went to the Crick Institute in London to work with Tim Mohun, who's also part of the COM project and use it H, where they use HRM to massively phenotype all the COM mutants. And I would just like to say that the level of resolution we reach uh, for uh, enhancer activity and uh, identifying uh, uh, expression domains with HRM, uh, with HRM is really superior and uh, unsurpassed. So practically the embryo is embedded in a resin, uh, sections at one microns, and then the photographs uh, are taken from the face of the resin block, not from the section. Each section is cut away, and then you rebuild, reconstruct by 3D reconstruction the entire embryo. And you can do this from in situ hybridization results looking at mRNA expression uh, and linking it to landmarks, anatomical landmarks and embryological landmarks, and also now we are doing it with activity uh, of LAG-Z stain uh, enhancer uh, embryos, uh, assayed for enhancer activity. So just to show you here, uh, the HRM uh, taking a picture here uh, of uh, the resin, the face of the resin block, and then this is linked to a microtome. Slices are cut out, and for each slice that is cut out, the microscope takes a new image of the face of the resin block, and to image only the head of an 11.5 embryo takes about 12 hours. So Tim Mohun has 12 of these machines working practically day and night at the creek. That's where I had much fun last summer. So we can see here how, for example, the 1.45 uh, enhancer element for SOX9, we can compare the classical imaging we do with uh, now the HRM that we are doing. Uh, while trying to raise funds to buy an HRM microscope, uh, uh, we send the LAGZ, uh, the beta gal stained embryos to London, and Tim Mohun sends back to Robert Tao in my lab the raw data, all the stacks, and then Robert reconstructs uh, these uh, 3D uh, images. And we can see that indeed the power is uh, unsurpassed, and we can see all the elements, uh, if I can play it for you, uh, linking the activity uh, of the uh, uh, enhancer uh, domains to the anatomical landmarks. We can go into the embryos, do ortho slicing, and so on and so forth. So for example, this element 145, as you can see, reaches uh, here high levels of resolution when you use HRM microscopy to look at the medial and, and lateral frontonasal process, at the maxillary process, you can look into the mouth, and so on and so forth. So uh, to conclude this part, uh, I showed you some characterization of the regulatory elements upstream of the SOX9 locus contained within the SOX9 TED and overlapping the region which is deleted in Pierre Robin syndromes. And I've shown you uh, characterization of these enhancers at, uh, regarding their uh, domains of activity. I also stressed how this uh, uh, activity is highly dynamic and can indeed vary uh, given few days of gestational uh, time. 
uh, this enhancers that we were unable to uh, find any reproducible pattern, uh, st staining patterns at 11.5 is now being reassessed at 9.5 of gestation, and we wouldn't be surprised to find uh, activity. So while we are doing this, uh, like Axel already mentioned, uh, uh, his laboratory is now conducting loss of function of two of these enhancer elements, the 145 and the 125 in the mouse. And of course, this will lead to a superior dissection of this region with obvious implication for understanding the, uh, the, the uh, pathogenesis of this uh, devastating uh, craniofacial defect. And I would just like to add that after moving to um, the Bay area from Cornell, it is really exciting to see how being within 50 minutes drive from UCSF to Stanford to Berkeley, uh, it is uh, a very exciting moment for our three laboratories, and practically one has the feeling that everything uh, uh, can be accomplished or nearly. So uh, I will just uh, show you a few more slides about the second uh, part of this uh, presentation, which is uh, some details on the use of epigenomics to map regulatory divergence in human versus chimpanzee. And again, in Johanna uh, lab with Rusty Gage, they uh, uh, developed uh, two lines, uh, IPS lines from fibroblasts of chimps, of adult chimps, and also used, as I said previously, three lines for all these genomic studies from humans. And uh, again, uh, the uh, discovery is that while there are invariant enhancers between the two species, there are enhancers which have completely lost uh, orthology, and there are enhancers where there are, there are quantitative changes at the level of these chromatin marks in the genomic maps, so that there is a bias either versus human or versus chimp in terms of the presence of chromatin marks that map enhancer signatures. And then intersecting these genomic maps with the RNA-seq uh, data sets obtained from human and chimp, uh, Tom X. Vigut is usually able to link a specific enhancer to a target gene that is differentially uh, regulated in a biased manner, expressed in a biased manner. So this is, uh, there are two examples that we mapped in my laboratory uh, for activity that are already published in the Prescott paper, and we see how one, uh, both of these enhancers are human biased. In other words, they are, uh, there is presence of chromatin marks in the human, but not in the orthologous chimp sequence. And we see how indeed, when we test the human sequence in our transgenic reporter assay, we have activity in multiple craniofacial domains, but in the, in, uh, when we test the, the chimp sequence, we see, in this case, shared activity only in the olfactory bulb and, and not in all the other craniofacial domains which are uh, highlighted in the, when we test the human sequence. Even more striking for this gene, PAPA, which is a metalloprotease uh, required for uh, bone remodeling, we see that the chimp sequence uh, really uh, doesn't give any activity in the craniofacial domains except for very weak activity in some cranial, neural, uh, cranial nerves compared to the human enhancer. So uh, the last two slides I'll show you are examples now of chimp biased enhancer. I showed you human bias. These are chimp biased enhancer for this BMP binding endothelial regulator. And I hope you can appreciate here how we have very weak activity in the frontonasal process in seven embryos out of eight PCR positive. But look what happens when you look at the, when you test the chimp enhancer. You have massive activity in the frontonasal process in three out of six. And uh, this is really uh, striking. And of course, if we look at the skull, at the, front, uh, the frontal uh, <coughs> bones of the skull of a human versus the skull of a chimp, uh, this presence of bossing is uh, most likely associated to the part, at least in part, to the gain of activity in the frontonasal process of this particular regulatory element associated to this uh, BMP binding endothelial regulator. So these experiments conducted in my lab but Ian Welsh, by Ian Welsh and Carissa. So now again, to conclude, the last uh, slide will show you um, how uh, uh, we believe that HRM has superior uh, 
power in order to really dissect the domains of activity of these enhancer and be able to uh, link them to <coughs> uh, craniofacial structures and anatomical landmarks. And here you see when Bob does the ortho slicing of the raw data that we receive from Mohun, you can really see how here there's activity uh, in the frontal nasal processes, in the telencephalic vesicles, and I will show you that this is the human uh, enhancer, but all this activity is lost in the chimp, when we test the chimp enhancer. So compare this and this, and you can immediately see that we have a loss of activity of the chimp orthologous element in the frontal nasal uh, processes, in the telencephalic vesicles, and so on and so forth. It is pretty striking if you compare. Even more striking when you do the ortho slicing, and you indeed see that there is absolutely no blue stain, no blue stain at all in all the frontal parts, uh, frontal nasal processes, and other uh, facial processes of the chimp element. So the last slide, to summarize it all, uh, this work has led us to do uh, ontology annotation of cranio neural crest enhancers, revealing association with genes involved in very important functions in development and involved in malformation of craniofacial structures. And this is a summary of what has been accomplished over the first four years and towards reaching our milestones. So to summarize in this last uh, slide, all chip seek from human and chimp enhancers have been already submitted to the FaceBase website. And uh, Tomek is in process of uh, working with the hub to submit the RNA-seq data sets that is in progress. In my lab, we have, despite uh, we had a slowdown when we relocated from Cornell to UCSF, but we feel we have completely now uh, got back up to speed. Uh, we were funded to conduct uh, 100 injections of constructs, and we have conducted 76 for human and chimp enhancer activity, completed or in progress, already cloned and being injected now. So in all, we have uh, completed the analysis of 52 enhancer elements, 20 pairs human chimp, and 12 uh, at the SOX9 locus, only human uh, um, enhancers. And what is, I believe, incredibly exciting for a developmental biologist like me, classically trained, is to see that 90% of the enhancer that Tomek, based on his bioinformatic analysis, showed to be biased human chimp or chimp human indeed show bias activity in vivo when we test them in vivo in, a, in an organismal complex, uh, context. I believe this is awesome and I'm very excited about this. And uh, this is how I will uh, end here. And thank you for your attention. And again, sorry for the disruption I caused. Thank you, Licia. Okay, so who's got questions? Are people sleepy? It's that post-lunch thing. Here we go. Okay. Start with this. Lovely talk, as always. Um, on the 1.25 versus 1.45, I guess a unifying model would be if there was a uh, common factor that was an activator for one and a repressor for the other. Um, have you looked to see if there's any sequence similarity or motif similarity between the enhancers? So you're saying if there are common motifs or different motifs in these enhancer elements of the 145 versus the 125? Yep. Okay, so the person who can answer that question in terms of sequences is obviously Tomek, who's here. Uh, if, if I may, so no, there is no small simulation and, and homology generally doesn't help with uh, enhancer analysis because they just are so permuted. That, uh, yeah. In terms of... Um, Motive analysis, it also doesn't help you because uh, on some aggregate analysis you can, you can see enrichments, but for individual enhancers, the, the num number of false positives uh, is insane. The only way you can really compare it is interspecies. You can see loss and gain uh, of, of motives, and those actually can be very predictive, in fact. But, but that's b basically because you control for all the stuff you don't understand because the sequences are very similar. These are all uh, the, the them, deletions yeah. in various uh, people and families. But I think also what is so amazingly, from my, in my opinion, from the 
From the biological point of view, it's so interesting is to see that some of these enhancers uh, have a completely dynamic activity pattern, and within a few hours of gestation, the presence, uh, they, are they are active in that domain, and then they are not active in that domain, or vice versa. And this has emerged really from these studies. So like testing at one time point, of course, gives you an idea, especially when you do this huge series, but doesn't really completely uh, go to the depth of the problem. So, Hi. Oh, sorry, I had, I had a question, Lisha. <laughs> no, so uh, I was a little bit curious about your sort of uh, dissecting of these enhancers into smaller pieces. So unless I missed it, I don't remember you saying how big, like, all of these pieces were. Usually so, they range from 300 to 600 mm -hmm. base pairs, uh, mm -hmm. these, these elements we received from Stanford and then we cloned them in. But in this case, uh, uh, Hannah in Johanna's lab had uh, um, broken this piece, uh, which was bigger actually, the um, 125, in different elements. And uh, uh, some actually were also tested in zebrafish. I didn't have time to say that. And uh, um, this S5 element was indeed overlapping, the small element overlapping the highest uh, peak mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, for presence of uh, H, uh, um, you know, all these chromatin marks and P300 and... Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I guess my, my real question, I mean, that was part of my question, but the other part was, did you try the large piece that encompassed all of those? And if you did, did it look the same as the one small active element? No, or, this is no. Uh, that's a very good point. And of course, for the sake of time, I didn't have time to go through everything. But this element was also tested, the complete piece. And we didn't have uh, very uh, satisfying results. It was iffy, the entire piece. But I must also say we didn't try enough because usually to get reproducible results, we need to do at least two rounds of injections, if not three, with the facility we are working with. And unfortunately, we don't have the funds to do all of that. That's why also Axel is helping uh, from his end to do some more of these elements. So we didn't really look, I don't feel confident that enough embryos were looked at of the entire piece. And then we went in for the smaller fragments. I was going to ask the same question, or to, to use different pieces in different combinations. I mean, why is it that we have such variation yeah. that would modulate the expression of this gene in fine tuning? Yeah, it would be very yeah. interesting to, you know, go even deeper and do uh, all the small pieces. And, but again, uh, and I know uh, now Steve will uh, laugh, but it is a question of funds. I cannot afford it. Uh, we receive funds for 100 injections, and we already go above that also with the help of Axel even more, but already in my lab, we already have done more injections than we receive fund for. So, is so. It the, is it, no, I'm is, sorry, but that's it, the nitty gritty reality. No, but uh -uh. there's these new, and I'm learning more about these stretch enhancers. Sorry, there, I didn't hear there you. There are these things called stretch enhancers that cover very large regions and modulate um, expression and not just these small pieces. So is there a limitation to what you can do? I mean, I, it's not the money, it's the limit, technical limitation of how much you can inject in. Yeah, I, we haven't looked at, you know, we haven't addressed that. Okay, anybody okay. else? Thank you.